this point in my life, I mean, I'm only, I'm not exercising to be physically a certain way anymore. I want to maintain what I have, but it really is for my, the, the mental, the, the mental aspects for people who are just starting a really good thing is to say to themselves, I'm just going to do five minutes because it's really the first five minutes is the hardest part, right? To get started. It's that motivation to really, you know, kick into gear almost 10 out of 10 times. Once people do that five minutes, it progresses into a longer workout. And I built an entire company around this. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the 2%, where as always, we are having awesome conversations with peak performers in all walks of life. Why? To help decode excellence help give you strategies, tips, tools, techniques that you can use to hopefully break free from the 98% and join the 2% of people estimated to be operating at their full potential. And I'm super excited to have Jennifer Cohen on the show today. Woo, Jennifer! Wow, I love that. Like, that's quite an intro, Eric. Thank you for having me. And I, I wish everybody would give me that woo-hoo when I came on their podcast or interview. So yeah. thank you. No problem. So you you got tons of uh, amazing experience and accolades, and that will naturally kind of get weaved in as we talk here. But you know, some right off the bat that are worth uh, mentioning. You're a best-selling author. You've written one book already. You have another coming, right? I've written three books already. Three I books see you already. do your research. It's okay. Nice. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, but great, great research there. No, I, I've written three books, um, all in the health and wellness, health and diet, health and exercise area. Um, my last one was called Badass Body Goals. And, but um, my, my newest book, it will be, it's, you know, how this, I don't know if you know, or people are familiar, but when you um, have a book deal and you're working with a publisher, it's, you you write a book and it doesn't even come out for like a year, year and a half. So right. I just penned my deal and it would be coming up in a year and a half. And it's going to be more on um, asking for what you want in life and behavioral change. So more like mental stuff, but being bold, going after things that you want and how to do it. Cool. So what do you want in life? What, what am I, what, what do you want in life? What do I want in life? Well, um, it, it's an ever changing, it's an ever changing thing, right? I think um, you have different goals in different areas of your life. You have personal goals, you have professional goals. And once you hit that mark, that benchmark, then you can kind of um, go for the next thing. So currently, what now I, I'm in a situation where what I want, I want to like, I want to have um I want to be around people and pick projects where, where I really enjoy the people. I want to grow a new, this new business that I'm, I, I just started with. I'm trying to grow that business. I want, what do I want? I want my kids to be very happy and very healthy. And that's an evergreen thing. So there's lots of different things I want. And it's about putting your, you know, kind of having, I guess, aligning your life. So those things can actually be achievable, nice. I guess. Right. Nice. And I know you're, so some of the other things that you are obsessed with include building healthy habits, right? To, to drive positive behavioral change. And, um, and you have a couple of nice, uh, uh, you're named 100 most influential people in health and fit, fitness and most impactful fitness entrepreneurs made both of those lists. So what drove, what drove that? Why all these special recognitions? Are you reading my bio? I, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think those lists are fun and fine and all that stuff. But um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I think that I always followed what my passion was, you know, like, I think it's really important to, for people to become very, to get to know themselves first, very, very well. Um, and, and then after you do that, you know, figure out, because um, I think number one, people are, are when you're not self-aware, you kind of start chasing and going after things that are maybe really far off from the point. But when you know yourself really well and you have something that you're truly interested and that you know you're good at or you're interested in getting better at, I think success is the byproduct, right? So you have to kind of start with knowing what, you, what you're good at, knowing who you are, knowing yourself really well, uh, and leading with the passion and leading what you're actually, what your strengths are. Um, and so those lists are kind of just, again, a byproduct of me always just kind of 
being true to myself um, and following what those things are. I've always been super interested and super passionate about like fitness and health. And I built my career around it, not by on purpose. It was, it was by accident in a way. And then it became on purpose. What what drives that? Why, why have you always been passionate about fitness and health? Where does that come from? You know, I think I've all, I I think it kind of, it, it, it helped kind of shift and change my own mental uh, strength. I think when I was younger, I was a little bit, um, you know, I just don't think that like, I was kind of, I was kind of, Flail, like flailing like everybody else you know when you're younger and you're trying to trying to figure out what you're what you like what you don't like I'm talking like you know in my 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 late teens right and then you know I started to exercise and work out and I noticed as I got stronger physically it, it made me stronger mentally and I got really addicted to those endorphins and that like that that feeling and where it became something that I I, I kind of really built into my daily routine and my habits very early on. And the, so fitness for me really teaches you, teaches, taught me goal setting. It taught me um, once you hit a certain place, then you, you know, to, to pass another place, you got to like hit benchmarks. Um, it, it, it taught me discipline. So for me, I have like a very strong relationship with fitness uh, when I went to school, after my first job was all, was in was at a sports team, and then a music, and then a record label. I only went into fitness when I was working for a label. I was head of marketing for a very big label, and I got to Los Angeles from a job I was doing in Canada, where I'm from. And the music world was shifting and changing, and it was all about the dot com world. And that's when I like kind of like thought to myself, you know what? Like, what I really love is is fitness is health. So I quit my job. And I actually became a personal trainer. um, Just because that's what I like to do. And what I did then was once I got my first certification, I thought of how I can use my network who I had, and I created a job for myself as a label trainer. So I went back to the record labels I had relationships with, and basically uh, pitched myself as Someone who, of course, understood how the marketing marketing works, and basically pitch myself as a trainer for the talent before they go on to do a tour or before they do a, a music video or whatever they were doing. So it was me taking my love and my passion and marrying it with my my network already and my resourcefulness, and that was like the beginning of my fitness journey, my fitness career, and that kind of evolved into different books and different products and. Then I had an app. I sold the app to Weight Watchers. There's been a lot of like different bench, you know, milestones in that space. Um, well, hang on, that, hang on, hang on. You, you just like casually. Oh, and then I had an app, and then I sold it to Weight Watchers. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get. I'm trying to like paint a picture, right? Like I didn't mean like, oh yeah, and I like I had an app, and that's it, and I got acquired. But what my, I guess the the art overarching point is that. It was something I, I took something that I was super, super interested in and passionate about. And I just built on that into an actual business that, or, or businesses, you know? So yeah. when people ask me what I do, I say, I'm an entrepreneur. Like people are like, well, what do you do in the fitness space? And you know, I, I love business, but I also love fitness. And the two don't, the two can go, you can, you can marry a couple, you know, more than one thing. You can be, you can be good at, you could be good at more than one things. You can have passion for more than one things. I think that it's really dangerous when you, A, you compartmentalize what, you know, just because I like fitness doesn't mean I'm not going to be good in this thing. Just because I like, you know, sailing doesn't mean I'll be bad at this. It's like really kind of like figuring out what you're good at and then figuring out how they all can marry together to be a career. Nice. So I took my, yeah, that's basically Nice. So you just mentioned sailing, and before we hit record, you were talking. Oh, yeah. about, you were talking about this because uh, so 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 I was talking about the you know the whole you know the background of the show rooted in Abraham Maslow's estimate that um, well in his research that you know our path to deepest fulfillment lies in reaching our full potential, but he estimated only two percent of people ever achieve that, meaning a lot of people kind of 
a die with a lot of stuff still on the table. But you were going to tell me about some sailboat thing and so. Forth. Oh yeah, just some sailboat. Thing. Well, no, when you because you were telling me about this two percent, uh, why I asked you why you named it that, and I thought it was very it's very coincidental because yesterday I was. I was watching somebody whose whole business was based around, they're a, psych they're a psychologist and they're based their entire learnings and, and career and philosophy around Maslow. And they created this, they, they had something called the sailboat theory. And I don't, I wasn't really like, it, it was kind of from Maslow. And I was kind of thinking like, what is it? And I didn't really remember it because then I, what I, what you, didn't hear me say because then you're like, wait until we press record is my kid was yelling at me and I couldn't read what the sailboat theory was. And so I wanted to know what that was. And I thought since you were a fan of Maslow, obviously too, maybe you knew what that was. But now that you brought it up, um, let me see, see if I can find it. Cause I, I, I love that. Save, save that whole little uh, conversation from going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, it, well, exactly. well, listen, I saved it all to her. It, it, you didn't let me even, ha like, you didn't let me finish because you're like, wait, wait. And I'm like, well, when he finds out that I have nothing to say about it, but yeah, now, no, okay. now everybody knows I know nothing. But there, it's a whole thing here. I can read it to one. Of the, can I read it to you? Or? Yeah, go for it. Um, it. Well, it's pretty long. After It's basically talks about one of the first things you need to know when, is when, oh, wait, this is about sailing. Hold on a minute. Um, the sailboat theory by, let me see. It's so, about motivation, really, but it's a sailboat metaphor. Okay, so it's on uh, Scott Barry Kaufman, I think is his name, his website, but I can... It's really long. I don't think you want okay. me to read this whole thing. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll shortcut it for people. So the, the short of it is that if you want to reach your full potential and stay motivated, you should buy a sailboat, right? Is that <laughs> what it is? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> no, not at all. But how about this? You can, how about this? They, they can Google it and see what it's about. But it's about motivation and how to self-actualize and all these other things that Kind of you're talking about so if, if there's any homework the homework really for you eric to kind of know more about what basil is about awesome yeah. what's the next book next book is coming up what's that going to be teaching people well no that book is much more about asking for what you want the behavioral uh changes because um in all of my work and things have evolved right like i, I came from the, the health and wellness space at that point but then it's my career kind of morphed into more um, high performance in all walks of life with CEOs, with companies. Um, and the bottom line is that at the end of the day, what holds people back is usually self-doubt. Self-doubt is like the, the killer to anybody's dreams, right? The, um, and so it's like, how do you really overcome self-doubt to uh, chase what you want and not just take what you get and not just take the good enough? And so I did a TED talk on this whole topic that uh, did quite well. And people, uh, obviously, they were, it struck a chord with a lot of people. And now I'm just really expanding on that entire notion, because I do believe that fear and self-doubt really do, um, is, is why people, why there is only a 2%, um, 2 versus the 98% that don't do their self-actualization. -actual, and it's, it's, it's kind of sad, because I think that we all have something within us that is um, special and that it makes us a superstar and it's really about finding what that is or tapping into what that is and exploiting it and ex and really kind of going after it and um, that's what kind of and that when you don't do it the the alternative is 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 actually like you know there's always a sense of regret there's always a sense of like malaise or disappointment um, and we only live once, so we might as well live at our fullest, optimize what we have. And that's what that's what the entire premise is, the entire philosophy that I try to live by. Um, and um, I'm really kind of like digging into the research now more. So there's a science based. So when I'm when I explain a lot of the stuff um, that I have things to truly back it up. And so, you know, Do you have a title title yet for the book? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure yet. It's going to talk about being bold for sure. Cause I think my, my entire theory again 
is about the, the idea and the philosophy behind repetition and about practice. Like anything else in life, you, you anything you want to get good at, you have to practice. It's a skill. So if you want to be bold, if or if you want to take French lessons, it's the same same thing. It's the same concept, which is you have to practice to get better. And consistency and practice really kind of take you from here to there. Like even Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, I mean, when they they practice 10,000 plus, plus, plus hours by doing the most basic thing, they're not practicing crazy, fancy drills. They're basically practicing just throwing the ball in the net over well, and over and over again. You know, this is cool. Do you, um, I can't remember what book it was, but... Um... There's a book about Kobe where uh, there's the the story of the author goes that like Kobe, uh, the author had asked Kobe, hey, can I come around and watch you shoot or, you know, do some practice? And he's like, yeah, <clears throat> sure. No problem. He's like, uh, I'll see you at 3.30 or something. And he's like, 3.30 in the afternoon. He's like, no, 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 3.30 in the morning. And so the author gets there, watch Kobe uh, practice. And for like, I don't know, it was like three hours or something. He's doing the most basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you know, shooting free throws and then doing layups and then doing, you know, three pointers and, you know, doing post moves. And, and it's just like all this basic stuff. And the author asked him, he's like, I don't, I don't get it. It's like, how the hell have you become the best, you know, guy in the game doing such basic fundamental things? And Kobe's answer was, well, how the hell do you think I became the best player in the game by doing exactly. that? Exactly fundamental things and so it's like so many things that you talk about there you know it's like fundamentals the consistency the discipline and I love um two words that I really latched on to when you were speaking about your new book <clears throat> you talked about um well you talked about fear but essentially you know the, the converse of that you're talking about becoming fearless and then that relates to bold and uh for years I I had these three words that I just had on the wall and I had two different sets of them. And I like practiced, uh, you know, tried them both out. And one was like fast, focused, fearless. And I just looked at that every day, be fast, focused, fearless. And then the other set I had was fast, focused, bold. So all I'm saying is giving you massive props for those words, for this book, this subject matter, because it is absolutely the number one thing I think that holds people back. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, no, and I, I do believe it. it. It comes down to the most basic, basic things, right? Like, it's not people try to overcomplicate things that are, don't really need that to be complicated. And it's the simple things, right? Like, at the end of the day, it's when if your foundation is strong, then you that's how that's when you can actually build something that's strong on top of it and more and more and more. If your foundation is week that can be towards you know Kobe Bryant when he practices and his the basic moves or you know me when I when I'm trying to get better at you know self-doubt or fear or wherever you need to kind of master the, the basics first yeah. and sometimes people forget that right it's like now you know like in, in everything in life everything becomes very fad driven very driven on like, you know, like for diets, like I'm going to do the inter I'm going to, I'm going to do the keto diet. I'm going to do this thing when really it's like, and, and people are looking for something that sometimes is not necessary, right? Like what about just like eating a balanced, healthy meal and not having to restrict and, you know, um, and, and do all those things, but people don't realize that there's a lot of like success in just following the, some basic rules of life, you know, just like any, or just like any plan, you know, the, at, at all, because I could, um, like you were just saying, you know, I, I could research and come up with 10 different ways to get in shape and, uh, change my eating. I could come up with 10 different ways to like improve my, I don't know, productivity or work routine, 10 different ways to like be a better father and, and you know, husband. Um, but, probably the simplest thing to do would just be pick one thing and just adhere to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, and just do it and, and do it over and over and over again um, and get really, really good and really, really comfortable in it and build that into a routine for consistency. Right. And that's basically that that's the beginning and the end of all of it. But, you know, I think a lot of time, and then when 
the problem sometimes can be when you are doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that and like you're kind of all over the place you end up doing everything kind of half-assed and not really good at anything so it's about sometimes just picking like one thing and being really focused and diligent and deliberate and then from that then you can move on and so you you're you know very focused on you know building these healthy habits and we talk about um, having a foundation in place from which you can you know, build further things from. Um, not all habits are created equal. What are like the, yeah. you know, what are like the power habits in your mind? So like the person who's listening right now and they're just like, oh my gosh, there's just so much that I could be doing, but that I'm not doing to start improving my health. I don't even know where to start. Like wh- wh- what are the power moves to make? What are the fundamentals? <laughs> Okay, some fundamentals, I think a couple things I think, um, number one, have keeping keeping yourself accountable, number one, that's just so have write down what you're doing in progress, because I think sometimes we that's why you know, I see that you're actually, by the way, wearing an aura ring. Like, yeah. I think I am too, right? Yeah. It, it's the data, it because it, it keeps all your data. It's a sleep tracker. I'm a I'm, I'm a big fan. And I believe me, I'm not work. I don't work with them or or whatever, but the, the guy just came on my podcast, the guy, the CEO. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's why I was going to just make a mention of it. But what I was going to say is having, keeping track and being accountable is super, super important for, for, um, for kind of building habits and, and, and kind of seeing yourself progress the reason w- or seeing where you are and what to do, because I think when you have no data, it becomes very willy willy nilly. It doesn't have to be the aura ring, but I think that some power habits are exercise daily. I think exercise first thing in the morning is one of the most, one of the best habits someone can get into. And I'll tell you why, because number one, if you start, if you start your day off well and doing something for yourself, that's really good. It will, it will keep you on. It's more of a, more likely to keep you on point for the rest of the day. It also gives you the energy. It makes you more productive. People think, oh, I'm too tired to work out. But actually, that work, that the, the jolt of energy and endorphins and serotonin and all the different like um, uh, mood enhancers, you will benefit in, you know, threefold through, through the day. Um, that's number one. Number two, for the cognitive and focus and all the alert stuff too. That's the first habit. Um, another habit is you know, actually is sleeping enough. I think that it's like the cheapest um, magic pill that you can get. <laughs> and, uh, and it's free. And it's the most it's, it's, it's basically on par with exercise for me. Um, because again, if you don't sleep properly, then everything else is off, you end up Again, your hormones are not are not elevated well. Your moods off. Your you know your focus, your cognitive abilities are off. Um, you end up eating more. Your everything that what people are trying to stay on point for becomes derailed. So having enough sleep. Now, what's enough for you versus me is very different. But that is why again, why you know having some kind of like accountability and trackability is super important. Um, and number, I want to say, and number three is back to the accountability is, you know, writing down your to-do list. And so when you do something, you check it off the list because like there's like an empowerment. It's very empowering when you actually accomplish something and then you cross it off that list and then move on to the next thing. And again, it gives you that accountability. It's a visual of what you need to do. So you're staying on point. Those are three easy ones that um, people can implement tomorrow. Now, when it comes to working out, people are like, oh, no, 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 no. You, I'm not saying you need to do a crazy, you know, hour, you know, intense run, but move your body for a good 15 or 20 minutes. That's enough to kind of get that, you know, activated. Um, and that could be anything, you know, going for a walk. It doesn't matter. It's just the fact that you're moving your body. You're, you're doing something for yourself. That's really helpful. So those are three. I can give you a hundred more if you'd like, but. Keep going. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, some cool threads that you had. So the whole, um, that whole like positive mood boost, I've, you know, I, I've gotten to the point so I, I have tons of injuries. I have like literally have like torn ligaments, in both my ankles, 
Uh, in both your what? Both my ankles. Uh, oh. and cartilage damage in my left knee. I ripped the ligament off the humeral head on the left shoulder. I haven't had him reattached. Fractured vertebrae. Were uh, you an athlete? Were you like a professional athlete at some point? Yeah, I wish. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was, um, no, I was like so mediocre when it came to sports. It was like sick. Um, oh, then where are the, all the injuries from? Just so I have like a genetic predisposition. So I have like bad collagen, basically. So my, my, oh. my, my collagen injures easily. And when it injures, it doesn't repair well. Um, oh. The reason I'm bringing this up is because um, for me, you know, I have to live with like a lot of pain all the time. Right. So like right now, as I'm talking to you right now, my left knee is flared up. I've been like icing it all day, but it's just like, I've just gotten used to it. So the wow. positive like mood, you know, effect of exercise, I think it's so important. And for me, like exercise is almost medicinal. Like I'm not going to the gym to, because, you know, I want to look a certain way or, you know, uh, uh, land a shot in Baywatch five. Is there a Baywatch five? I have no I idea. don't think there is, but I, I, I get what you're trying to say. You don't want you're not trying to be a fitness model. Yeah. But, no. um, uh, which I think you are, aren't you? Aren't you a fitness model? No, oh my God. I mean, I appreciate that, but why would you think I was? Is it in I, that? Is that in my? That's not in my bio. I think I saw something in there, or maybe it was just the Instagram feed. Anyway, the, um, I think it's the fact that maybe when I was like much younger, um, I did a lot of endorsements and spoke spokesperson work for people. Right. Um, but I was, I would never tout myself as a, as a fitness model, but I'm going to yeah. take that anyway and run with it. I'm going to put that in my bio. <laughs> <laughs> this well, I'm going to, well, yeah, I'm going to put that. I, you know, used to be a professional athlete. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're making up our own reality now. It's perfect. I love it. Yeah, exactly. No, but, but what, um, the, the point I'm trying to, you know, make for, uh, you know, the benefit of people listening is that exercise is so powerful that you, you don't need to want to look a certain way. You could simply want to be happier, feel better about yourself, have like this positive, like influx of hormones, like you're saying. And, and it becomes, you know, in a way like you're, you're antidepressant. Like, I mean, even on days when I'm feeling like in a complete funk and I'm like, down and you know in a bad mood i i actually know that oh my gosh if i just go and work out right now like that's going to solve everything right it's 100 percent. i agree totally you know because your physi your your psychology 90 percent of your psychology is driven by your physiology at least that's what i believe so it by the way it's not just what you believe there's been a ton of research i mean I could not agree with you more. I, at this point in my life, I mean, I'm only, I'm not exercising to be physically a certain way anymore. I want to maintain what I have, but it really is for my, the, the mental, the, the mental aspects. And I actually always say to what you just said, which is like, it is a nap, exercise is a natural antidepressant. So if it's, it's a, it's the best mood, um, basically balancer or enhancer that there is or none. It can be, it beats out anything else. And I know people actually who've gotten off of antidepressants when they've in incorporated um, a work, like working out into their life daily. I mean, I know even for myself that if I, my, I'm, a, I'm a very like ADD kind of person, right? Like I want to do this, I'm shiny ball there. I'm very much like that. And ends up like, if I don't have, if I don't work out, I'm like not not properly focused. It is the amount of um, health benefits, mental benefits, mental health benefits you get from exercise. It is, is so amazing that if I feel like people just need to kind of get off over that initial like uh, hump. And then once they kind of like, once they start doing it at, at enough of a regular, you know, regularly, it naturally becomes the, it part of their they're part of their routine because of it, you, you get addicted to that feeling. How do you get over that initial hump? How do you get the ball? I think repetition. I think that you have to, and there's no, again, I hate to say it, but like anything else, what I think what happens is like you practice anything else, you do it, you don't like it, you do it, you kind of, I don't feel like it. You, you do it and you do that enough where eventually 
there's like a little bit of a like a pivot or that tipping point where it's just like okay I may not like it but I love the after effects of what happens I know what I I know now if I do it to your point how I'm going to feel after so that's that's good enough for me to do to, to to even do it I also think for people who are just starting a really good thing is to say to themselves I'm just going to do five minutes, right? Because it's really the first five minutes is the hardest part, right? To get started. It's that motivation to really, you know, kick into gear. Nine out of 10 times, almost 10 out of 10 times. Once people do that five minutes, it progresses into a longer workout. And I built an entire company around this because the hardest part is putting on your clothes, putting on your shoes and doing that first few steps. Once you do that, you know what I mean? You're like, well, I'm already here. I've already put my shoes on. I already did this part. I might as well keep on going. And you know, when we're talking about that app, my app, my fitness app, what it was called hot five, five minute workouts. Nice. So yeah, this is, this is like when you were talking, I was just thinking, Oh my God. So, I um so and I I I wrote a book called uh, the Three Alarms and um in there wrote, was, what was it called uh, the the Three Alarms oh the Three Alarms and um and in um and I write I have a whole productivity section in there and I talk about uh, overcoming procrastination and I talk about how um procrastinate procrastination is just like a uh, you know coping mechanism it's resistance. And usually the resistance, well, part of the resistance is created because you're sitting there and the phrase in your mind is, I have to finish. And that's like overwhelming because I, yeah, I have to, it's like you're being forced to do something you don't want to do and finish is completely endless. And so what I always say is I choose, because you can choose to do something that you don't even want to do. So choose, I choose to start for just five minutes. And so I use that exact same thing. And I, you know, I always tell people, you'll never know when the 300th second has passed. Like you, right. just, you just get lost into, into what you're doing, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, but it's all, a psych- it's all psychological mind, mind, like mind tricks that you do. It's all about like, you know, it's really, it is. It's like, okay, how do I psychologically like make me, like get myself to do this for a little bit? Or how do I... You know, what's, what's the kind of trick and tip, my, what kind of mind trick can I put on, can I, can I do to make me get from here to here? It's like, it's like an increment, the incremental amount is the hardest amount yeah. to, to do something, right? So, so going back to habits, why do you, why do you think people struggle to, um, to, to, you know, even get the habits in place. You know, you talked about fear, for example, fear and um, you know, not wanting to be, you know, bold. Self doubt. Self doubt. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, self uh, fear and self doubt. Where, where does that come from? Like, what what are people afraid of? I think people are afraid of rejection. I think people are afraid of rejection and fi- and failure. I think that we have so much, t- so much like baggage that we're carrying around with ourselves from like when we were younger about, you know, kids making fun of us if we don't say that. So do you remember when you were a baby or, you know, not you remember your, but, you know, when, when babies in general, they'll do whatever. They don't care if people are, are looking at them. They don't care if they like, you know, if they, if they spit up or they burp or like whatever, they just kind of go on with their day. You know what I mean? Like they're like, ah, they don't, they're like oblivious. And then as we get older, we get so paranoid and, um, uncomfortable or intimidated by what other people think of us, that that then drives our behavior moving forward. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to look dumb. We don't want to look ugly. We don't, it's all about other people's perception, right? Yeah. And if we can kind of figure out a way to not allow other people's perception infiltrate and infiltrate us to that point or block out other people's opinions and perceptions or whatever and just focus on us what we're doing yourself and like moving forward you know passing this thing doing that like it, it's so like not only is it empowering but it's so it's so helpful to like someone's like overall like happiness and success right like people are people don't go to the gym because they're they don't want to look stupid 
and they don't want to look they don't want they don't want to look feeble they don't want to like want other people to see them you know not be able to do something well like in what world why does everyone have to be perfect or great at something for them not to feel uncomfortable by even the try even the attempt right and here here's the the funny thing i discovered is that People don't really care that much. People don't. And that's the irony. People are so concerned with themselves and like what they're doing that they're not even paying attention. They're not even noticing you 99% of the time. Yeah, but exactly. It, it does. But it, again, like this is where the, the disconnect is. What you know to be true and what, you know, what you know psychologically or psych like what you know is human nature and psychologically doesn't necessarily compute when it comes to yourself and that's where that's where the rubber meets the road that's the part where you need to kind of you know really focus on to make real change what's what's the biggest fear that you've stepped into in life i think i think a fear of look i think fear of failing and fear of looking stupid i think those are the two those are the two biggest ones i think you know, I don't love public speaking, you know, like it says it make me, it's uncomfortable for me. It says, um, it says you're an international speaker and you're buying. A hundred percent. It doesn't mean that I don't do it. Right. And if you would let me finish sailboats, you would hear what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. So like, just because you are bad at something or uncomfortable with doing something doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. That's the only way to overcome something is to yet again do it over and over again right so until it, it becomes benign and comfortable my entire so i did this like again i did this ted talk and my the, a big portion of this philosophy about getting over the self-doubt getting over the fear is it's called the 10 percent target and the idea behind it is that you make 10 attempts at whatever you want most in life and you know, you may not get that exact thing, but another opportunity will present itself that you never even knew existed by just putting yourself out there. Um, and so with, you know, me doing that TED talk actually was me putting myself out there in a situation that wasn't very comfortable for me. You know, um, I, I, you know, I get asked to speak at places. I get a lot of anxiety from it. I, I don't love it. But every time I know that if I do it again, you know, I'll get that much better at it, right? Because practice makes, you know, progress. Um, and on top of that, um, it will help kind of like, you know, it'll help kind of like eliminate my fear just that much more because what's the worst thing that can happen? So people don't like it, I, I, you know, like what, what's the worst? So the only way to get past something is to kind of go, you know, is to kind of go through it a little bit. So. Am I, do I do a lot of speaking? I do, I do a fair amount and it's because I don't like it and it's because I'm bad at it and I, or I, I'm bad at it in the sense that I'm uncomfortable with it and I'm scared for it is why I keep on doing it because I want to also practice what I preach to other people. I can't tell you to do that for whatever you're trying to do. And then on my own, in my own life, like just, just kind of avoid it and not do it, even though I know you know what I mean? How to kind of yeah. make it better. But but you're you're training your professional muscles in the same way conceptually as you train your physical muscles. So you know you go into the gym and you're you're not like show me the most comfortable weights, right? You, you're, right. You 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 step into the, the the challenging exercises and the stress builds strength. You get stronger as a result. So I guess that's what you're doing. Every time you step out on stage, you're lifting that, you know, professional speaker, you know, dumbbell, right. And getting stronger. Exactly. For, for, you know, for all intents and purposes, like the truth is, yeah, you are. I mean, that is, I mean, I go to the gym all the time and I phone, you know, I phone it in a lot these days because I just do what I'm comfortable with because, you know, it's easy. And then there are times when I like catch myself and I'm like, wait, 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 that's why I'm plateauing. That's why I'm not growing. Um, that's why I'm not, you know, getting anywhere is because I'm not pushing beyond what my, you know, my comfort zone is. I mean, the reality is in life and in, 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 in your professional life, your personal life, in your, in, in your spiritual growth, everything requires growth and movement. 
right? Or else it just dies. Mm -hmm. Or just, like I said, if it's plateauing and it's just status quo, you might as well, why why continue? It just, it becomes boring. Um, So you need to be able to push push those boundaries as you kind of um, hit them um, in 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 every area of your life. If you had to pick one song that describes your life, what would you pick? How about I'm a survivor by like Destiny's Child? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, Independent Woman by by Destiny's Child. Um, nice. Um, you know what? I like Demi Lovato's song "Confident." I like that song because I think it's like it, it makes me feel like I can go through anything. I like that. I'm gonna pick her. That's the song I'm going with. Awesome, awesome. All right. So you have. Um, Got three other people at home, right? Got your husband and I have my husband. I have my two kids. Yeah. yeah. How do you? Um, so let's say somebody is there, health wise, entrepreneur wise, fear wise. Um, how 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 do you get the rest of the household on board? Like, what do you do? Like, what do you do to kind of encourage this way of thinking, this way of being? You know, um, in your other half and in the in the young ones. Anything that you can share there? I think I think the best way to do that, and not with me, with anybody, is to lead by example. I think when you just tell somebody over and over again what they you should do this, do that, do that, it kind of falls on deaf ears. I think the most effective is when they see you doing something, and you, you, then they want to participate. Then they want to be involved when they see the you know the fruits of that labor. I think that's always the most. That's the best way. You know, lead by lead by example. That's when you're leading, running a company, running a household, running anything. You know, uh, a softball team for your child. Lead by example. What do you? What? How do you want? You should lead. You should show people how they. What you want them to do by you doing it yourself. And that's why I said to you earlier about the whole idea of if I'm not a good speaker and I just kind of like say, screw it, I'm not going to do it. How do I go and tell everyone else to make, make better att- 10 attempts at going through their biggest fear and just keep on going when I don't do it myself. You have to, you have to say what you, you know, you, you got to kind of mean what you say and you got to say, and you, you got to do what you say, you know what I mean? And say what you do, whatever that saying, what is that saying, Eric? It's like, you know, um, I think someone's intention and word is really, really important. And you got to lead by that example and you've got to like live by that example. Yeah, totally. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I always, um, um, I had, um, I was talking about growing up the other day and I said, um, you know, growing up is not about reaching a certain age. It's about not expecting others to do things that you don't role model and do yourself. Right. So it's like, right. we, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, and, and that applies to absolutely everything from parenting to your health to, to work. What do you, what do you, what do you believe that others don't? Hmm. Well, I don't know what everybody believes, right? Because how would I know? I don't know what you believe. Um, I believe that, well, I think, actually, I think a lot of things I believe are kind of one of those things that I think they're quite universal. Like, I believe that people need other people to to be successful in life. I think things are not done in a vacuum. Um, I believe that um, having one good friend is more important and more valuable than having a bunch of like randos around you who don't mean anything, you know? I believe that, um, you know, I think what I believe is whatever that, whatever, you know, is your, I I believe that people should follow what they know is true for themselves. I really do believe that and not just follow, follow, follow the herd. I think what happens a lot now, right? People just follow along without questioning what's going on. I think independent thinking is really, really important. And I think that people should, um, exercise it as much as possible. Um, what do I believe? There's a lot of things. This is like, that's a big question. Can you like, can you kind of like hone it down I, a little? I, 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 I mean, I love, 
I love what you said about, you know, I, I, I believe that people should really follow what's true for, for them, right? Because so often, you know, a lot about of what we were talking about certainly relates to the self-doubt and the fear is that people are thinking too much from other people's perspectives and not enough from, from their from own. Their own. And, and like we were saying earlier, it's like, I'm so worried about what they think about what I'm doing and they don't even care. It's like, that, you know, it doesn't even matter, uh, it, right? It, you know what I also believe? I believe that being super smart is detrimental. I think that being too, super, being too smart is a hindrance on someone's ability to thrive. I think there's a be- there's a beauty in mediocrity because it forces people a lot of times to have to like you know be resourceful and go after things and grow as a person. Sometimes when you when you're so smart, you get everything handed to you, you think it, it it like diminishes the quality of character that you have because it wasn't it was so easy, you know. And be- I also think when you're too smart, you know. McKinsey, that you're so much about like strategy and solution that you there's you, there's a lot lost in nuance and and hustle. I I um my uh, well, he's 16 now, but must have been like 14 or so. My uh, oldest son when um he was asking me about um no he he was he was talking about how certain you know certain kids in the class were you know, they're way smarter than me. Uh, he said, and I was like, Alex, they can be, you're always going to be meeting people way smarter than you, yeah. but there's no way that they can outwork you. Right. And that's, that's the way to do it. So Jennifer, I really, um, yeah, I love chatting with you. Um, so many cool ideas, very excited about the new book coming. I wish we had the title so we could Sure. Well, it, it, it's just happening. I, I didn't realize this, this kind of happened so fast. I'll come back. We can talk again in a year when it's, when it's out. Awesome. And where do, so it, you got your own podcast as well, right? So uh, yeah. if people want to hear more from you or get in touch, how do they do that? Well, my podcast is called Habits and Hustle. Um, you can see the crooked sign behind me. I just, I think it just got moved. <laughs> um, and you can follow me on Instagram at the real Jen Cohen. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't, I think it's just my name, Jennifer Cohen. And uh, I think that's good. Awesome. My website. Jennifer Cohen.com. Yes. Jenny Cohen to you. (laughs) Awesome. Jennifer, thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming on the show. And um, absolutely. Yeah. Look forward to talking about your book in a a year's time. Thank you so much. So, all right. See you soon. And if you like that interview, you're going to absolutely love my next one as well with Peter Taunton. Click it right here. You're going to love our discussion. Peter's achieved an incredible amount in both his business and life. And I'll see you there.